On the 28th of August 2008, my friend Oliver was stabbed eight times in an unprovoked attack, which left him paralysed. The youth-led charity, Art Against Knives, that I now run, was created in response to this attack. Its mission, to ensure that every young person can create a life that they want, free from violence. I believe the best way to do this is to give every young person an opportunity to tap into their own creativity. Now, this isn't about getting them to put pen to paper. It's not about getting them to paint a pretty picture. This is about giving them the tools that they need to be able to express, communicate, and to think creatively. Oliver was attacked by a group of six young teenagers who I believe were not given these skills or opportunity. Um, if they had, then I wouldn't be standing here today, and I definitely wish that I wasn't. I can remember when I first entered um, the charity sector aged just 21, and I felt like I was surrounded by these very large, shiny organisations who could quote these really, really, really big numbers, and they were quite obviously driven by results. There were large pots of money or pots of money around, and I felt that actually the only way to access these was if you had these large numbers on a piece of paper. And it felt to me that success was actually being measured by whether or not we'd, we'd reach those outcomes. I think too often we are, even today, far too focused on this big idea, on this outcome, and we forget that we need to pay attention to some of this detail. It's only really been the last five years that actually universally we're talking about this idea of intervening early to prevent a problem from happening in the first place. In fact, actually, only a couple of weeks ago, a coalition of, of 50 organisations have proven that the government's failure to intervene early is costing the UK taxpayers £17 billion. But I think this is where we're making our first mistake. In order to intervene early, we need to have trust. We need to have trust with these communities these families, and most importantly, with every young person that we come in contact with. Three years ago, I was invited onto Dollis Valley Estate in North London by an ex-gang member who was working as a youth worker there. He had successfully engaged with a group of young people who were considered hard to reach and had identified the need for positive female role models. So he invited me up to come and do some work. So here's where I have to be honest. It took me four weeks to be able to have a conversation with one of these girls. So one day, in a moment of desperation, I went to my handbag and I found a nail polish and I said to the one of the girls, please, can I paint your nails? It was actually in that 10 minutes that we had together that we were able to build the foundations for this relationship. I think there were a number of factors here. I think there was an element of touch. I think there was an act of doing something for someone. Um, and to be fair, she wasn't going anywhere until those nails were dry. But by the end of it, there was something there. So every Tuesday, I started turning up with my bag of nail polishes. And soon, one girl turned to 30. I think sometimes we're so focused on what that outcome is that we're forgetting it's actually often about having a conversation. I think our next step in this process is to listen. And by listen, I don't mean let's hold a focus group. I don't mean let's invite a group of young people into a room and ask them what they want. And I definitely don't mean let's actually chuck money into some kind of community questionnaire. I mean listen. On a Tuesday afternoon, my job isn't to paint other girls' nails or teach others how to do so. It's actually to listen. Over the past three years, myself and my colleagues, of which 50% are volunteers, have listened to over 270 females across two estates in North London. This has given us the opportunity to build trusted relationships that's exposed these very unique and individual risks faced by each one of those girls. We actually now understand their past, the effect that that's had on their present, and most importantly, we've worked with them to understand what they want from their future. Our next hurdle 
is to ensure that we are creating strong, independent, resilient young people. I don't think that this is about creating a culture of dependency that actually quite often this piece of paper and these numbers are asking us to do. This is about focusing on this exit strategy. It's about opening that door and knowing that when that young person walks in one straight line, that they're not dependent on support services. Um, last week, I got a text message from one of the original girls who started at the nail bar. In fact, there was one point in the last three years where her attendance at school was 45%, and her attendance at Dollar Store's nail bar was 98%. This text message read, sorry, I can't be there on Tuesday. I'm at work. We haven't just been staying on the estate and staying in the community with the girls. We've actually been taking the nail bar out and about into different communities, both locally and actually into places like central London and giving the girls an opportunity to meet other inspiring, positive females. But actually, this has also been about getting those other inspiring, positive females to meet these inspiring young people. I think these opportunities for conversation have always been mutually beneficial. And actually, they've been successful at breaking down negative stereotypes in terms of class, gender, generation. We've been able to offer these girls what we call transferable skills. And honestly, for me, they're just skills that we are not taught in the classroom. We've also been able to access young males. Currently, on one of our music projects, over 60% of the participants have been engaged through our relationships with their sister, friend, girlfriend, or mum. So, if you'd asked me five years ago to put all of these outcomes on a piece of paper, definitely would not look the same. I think that we've been successful because we've been able to listen, engage, We've been able to be creative, and most importantly, we've been able to let young people lead the way at all times. So here's a thought. If we actually paid attention to this detail and this process, then we might actually get to the end result. I think this is about refocusing our energy and paying attention to the day-to-day. -day. It's definitely about giving as much attention to the present as it is to that end result and the future. When I think beyond and I think of where Art Against Knives is in 10 years' time, I expect it to be rooted in these communities, but ensuring that they still have ownership. I expect it to be strong enough to be able to respond to the needs of every single individual. And I expect it to be flexible enough so that we can stop, reflect, and adapt at every turn. And most importantly, I expect that when we do open that door, the young people are walking in a straight line, very confident of their own futures. So thank you.